Well, good morning, church. I am uh, Mike Bechtold. I'm the youth pastor here, and it is a blessing to be here with you this morning. Uh, As Jessica said, kickoff is upon us, and there's a lot of things happening uh, starting next week, and so there's a lot of things to be excited about. Um, But I want to encourage you uh, to consider kickoff uh, these next few weeks as an opportunity for evangelism. Uh, with uh, new routines starting and people looking out new, checking out new things, I encourage you to use this opportunity to invite uh, those where you do life to come and be a part of our community, uh, especially for those who have been out of the church for a long time or those who have maybe never set foot into a church. This next year is the best time to get started because we are going to be going through Scripture and going through the entire big picture of God's story. So it's a great opportunity, and I encourage you to uh, be inviting those where you do life. So we are wrapping up the sermon series on the fruit of the Spirit this morning, and it's been a good journey as we have been digging into this passage in Galatians 5 and dwelling on the reality of what living by the Spirit uh, creates in us. And so today we find ourselves at the end, uh, the last of the fruit mentioned by Paul. But before we dig in, let me pray. So Father God, we come before you now as we uh, jump into your word. I pray uh, that you would speak to us and that you would uh, let this rest in our hearts this morning. In your name we pray. Amen. So if you would, open up your Bibles to Galatians chapter 5. Uh, we are going to read one last time uh, the passage for our sermon series this summer. So Galatians chapter 5, starting at verse 22. And I will be reading from the NLT version. So verse 22. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. So uh, let's start by recognizing that self-control isn't really a fun topic to talk about um, because not only do we see many times around us uh, where there's a lack of self-control is an obvious issue, uh, which we'll get back to in a moment, but then when it's the good stuff, that we have to exercise self-control, we feel like we're restricting or limiting ourselves. I mean, just think about things like your wedding day, or perhaps you just won the lottery, or perhaps you just got behind the wheel of a 1967 Shelby GT500. Self-control should not be in the dictionary, right, in those moments, Uh, but it is. And self-control is a characteristic that comes out in both the good and the bad. Because self-control is seen as the ability to control the expression of whatever is before you. So whether this is your emotions, your actions, or your words, it's being able to control these things, especially when something is happening right in front of you in your life. So it's having dignity and restraint and discipline in your life. And so the opposite, we've been talking these series about the opposite and the counterfeit to help us understand this word a little better. And the opposite of self-control would be impulsive, uh, indulgence, and many times the idea of YOLO, which is a youth slang for you only live once, seize the day, live in the moment. Uh, Those are really the opposite of self-control. And the counterfeit, the things we think might be self-control but really isn't, is willpower. Okay. While willpower is not necessarily a bad thing, it's recognizing that it is an all-about-me action. I was able to accomplish this on my own. I had the power to do this. Self-control comes from within and not as an action, but as a characteristic. We find ourselves at a place where we are naturally able to control ourselves. And so this word self-control in the passage in Galatians 5 comes from this Greek word egratia, and I love this. It's not just meaning about being controlling, but actually being the master of control. Having complete control over ourselves. Isn't that interesting? So let's take a peek and uh, name some obvious places where we see in our own culture that we might uh, not be doing so hot at being masters of self-control. I think a big one could be excessive shopping, okay? I mean, think about the extreme situations that happen on Black Friday where people are pushing and shoving and getting in fights and being herded through gates like cattle and literally being trampled to death just for another TV. Where do you think they lost self-control? 
Another one could be drinking. I mean, think about the handful of passages like Ephesians 5.18 that says don't be drunk with wine but, uh, because that will ruin your life. But the Center of Disease Control released a report that 38 Americans binge drink four times a month. And likewise, there are approximately 88,000 deaths each year in the U.S. due to excessive alcohol use, making it the third leading cause of death in America. Where do you think they lost self-control? Or how about sex and pornography? I mean, I don't think I need to say much other than it continues to be one of the top keyword searches online. And then there are all those issues like controlling your anger and gossiping about the latest story and playing with your phone and how we respond when somebody states their view on fill in the blank. Or how about when your kid just won't leave their sibling alone for the 20th time? Or kids, how about when your sibling won't leave you alone for the 20th time? Right? When I think about even the self-control issues I recognize with, the first image that comes to mind is one that I know we are all familiar with. That part of the song where Princess Anna sings, I want to stuff chocolate in my face. Right? Okay? If you're like me, what is fun about not getting to eat all that chocolate? But let's be honest for a second and recognize that gluttony especially in a culture of plenty, creates huge problems for self-control issues. I mean, fighting the urge to take all you want instead of only what you need, and that philosophy will dig into many other areas of our lives, including shopping and drinking and so forth. Now, I don't want you to take this as a guilt trip, but I want us to recognize that being a master of self-control is a very hard thing to do. It's very hard. And it especially when it involves things we like. I mean, I remember several years ago, one of my relatives loved collecting Beanie Babies. Anybody remember these things, Beanie Babies? All right, a couple of hands around the room. Um, So there was absolutely nothing harmful about collecting something. In this case, it was these cute little stuffed animals, right? But for my relative, what was intended to be a fun hobby turned into an obsession, And over something so simple and harmless, it was evident that there was no self-control. And through the decisions made, money spent, and time invested, this simple hobby did much more damage to relationships and themselves than you could think would even be possible. It just goes to show that self-control issues comes in many forms, and it looks different for everybody. Now, this, uh, this Greek word, edgratia, that Paul uses in uh, Galatians 5 actually shows up several other places in Scripture, too. Uh, one verse, it uh, is geared towards the sexual relationship between a husband and wife in 1 Corinthians 7. And another reminds us to prepare for a time when the world will no longer have self-control in 2 Timothy 3. But then there are a lot of verses that talk about and encourage us to be putting into practice self-control. So Titus 2.2 Uh, Paul encourages Titus to teach older men to exercise self-control. 1 Timothy 3, 2, in regards to the church uh, and the elders in the church, uh, Paul says that they must live their life above reproach. He must be faithful to his wife and he must exercise self-control. And then skipping down to verse 11, in the same way, their wives must be respected and must not slander others. They must exercise self-control in everything they do. 1 Peter 1.13, Peter is writing to the churches in what is present-day Turkey, and he says, prepare your minds for action and exercise self-control. And finally, sir, uh, 2 Peter 1.5-8, make every effort to respond to God's promises. Supplement your faith with generous provision of moral excellence, and moral excellence, knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with patient endurance. And he goes on to say a little later that the the more you grow like this, the more productive and useful you will be in your knowledge of Lord Jesus Christ. So these are some great passages that encourage us to be putting into practice this mastery of self-control. But I want to uh, have us recognize that there's a distinct difference between all these passages that encourage putting into practice self-control and our passage this morning in Galatians 5. And that's Galatians 5 verse 22. The Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Okay, it doesn't say your hard work or your self-effort will produce this fruit. Uh, This isn't something we can just have and try to have more self-control like the other passages encourage because all of the fruit 
This comes out of evidence through our relationship with Jesus Christ. So the deeper we press into Christ, the more our character will change from the inside and reveal this fruit because the Spirit is at work in our life. So what does this mean for us? Because if you're thinking, okay, Mikey wants us to have a little more self-control, well, I just popped that application bubble saying it doesn't work that way. So now what? Note that the fruit of the Spirit, this list here, isn't the end of the passage. Jump back in here with me. We, uh, we've been talking throughout the series about the passages that started before it. There's this list of sinful desires. So join me at verse 19. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I have told you before, that anyone living this sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. Okay, so the reality is, we naturally desire these things. Okay, we can't just stop because it's a part of who we are. It's our human, sinful nature to desire this thing, these things. Uh, and it's interesting to note how much the fruit of the Spirit is the exact opposite of this list. And so then when Paul contrasts the s- desires of the sinful nature to the fruit of the Spirit, this is how he concludes the chapter. Verse 24. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. Let us not become conceited or provoke one another, or be jealous of one another. So those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to the cross. I mean, that's such a beautiful picture of that moment when I belong to Christ, all of the desires of my flesh no longer mattered. That while the temptations may never go away, my old nature and the desires of my flesh disappeared on that cross. I gave it up so I could be refilled by the fruit of the Spirit in every way possible. To be filled with love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control and to be known that I'm being filled by the Spirit. I want that. That is my new nature. I want to be filled by the fruit of the Spirit. But since it comes from the Spirit, since He's the one who does the work in my life, and that's what the evidence comes from. What can I do? I want to be filled. What can I do? I want you to write down this word that I'm going to tell you in a minute. It's a very important word. Uh, It's a hard word that I know many of us, even myself, has a hard time doing. Uh, But this word, I think, is one of the most important parts of our journey and spiritual practices that we do. So here's this word I want you to write down. Listen. Listen. Okay, listen, and uh, Paul says in verse 25, let, the, uh, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. And in order to be led by the Spirit, we need to listen. And that may be the hardest thing we do because it requires our time, it requires our attention, and it requires our investment. Three of the most costly things to get from American culture. Okay? Number one reason I hear uh, from people who decline everything, from volunteering in our community uh, to cleaning the apps running in the background of their phone, is I don't have enough time. And they're right. They don't have enough time. Because between all the events, the chores, the meals, the trips, the career, and so on, we have become workaholics at managing our schedules. And it's easy to say, I don't have time because while it is true, it's easy. You don't have to do anything or figure out how to change your schedules in order to make things work. But if it's important enough to you, whatever that may be, if it's important enough to you, you'll figure out how to manage your time to either do both or drop the other thing. Because what's important enough to us is worthy of our time. So I ask, is it important enough to you to give up of your time to listen to where the Spirit is leading you, whether that's through uh, digging into Scripture every day or spending time in prayer and silence or being in a community where you can learn to hear the Spirit's voice? Is it important enough to you? Likewise, uh, it's really hard to get our attention nowadays. 
I mean, between all the nonstop entertainment and social media at our fingertips, you think it would be a lot easier to give our attention to other stuff. But it's not. And then you throw in all the other distractions that come in in life. We have to learn how to give our attention to do other things. For example, I remember uh, early on in our marriage, my wife learned that she could not talk to me and while I was uh, watching TV. I, just, I couldn't do the both at the exact same time because she'd literally have to grab me by the face and say, Mike, listen, right? I know I'm not the only one out there, right? <laughs> and so nowadays it's gotten easier because I've learned that I need to either shut off the TV or walk away from it to talk to my wife. And while that sounds funny, it's something that it's a great illustration that we just have to learn how to do these things. Because you'll notice again, if it's important enough to you, whatever that may be, and my wife was very important to me, whatever that may be, you will figure out how to give it your attention. All because what is important to us is worthy of our attention. So I ask, is it important enough to you to give your attention towards listening to where the Spirit is? is leading you. Whether that means actually going out and finding a quiet spot or removing distractions like putting your phone off or uh, going to quiet your mind of your to-do list for the day so you can give complete attention to listening to the Spirit. And lastly, it takes something special for us to invest into something. Okay, my wife loves to watch the show Shark Tank. Anybody an avid fan of Shark Tank out there? A couple of you, okay. (laughs) Um, So basically it's where these random people come in and pitch their uh, product to uh, some wealthy investors. And if you throw out the reasons of greed and making money, because we all know that's part of the show, I feel like I've seen two other reasons why these investors would invest. And the first one is because they believed in it. Okay? They believed that the product was a great product and it was worthy of their money as well as their time and attention. But then I also think I saw some times where they had a heart for it. Something in the pitch struck a chord in their heart and they knew they had to get involved because this would impact someone or something that they cared about. So whatever the reason is, uh, whether it's choosing to donate money towards that next youth missions trip or uh, going on uh, uh, running with Team World Vision this October, whatever the reason is, if you don't believe in it or have a heart for it, you're not going to care much about it. So I ask, is it important enough for you to invest in listening to where the Spirit is leading you? Whether that means trying out new things to hear the Spirit's voice, or maybe it means actually doing what the Spirit is telling you to do. I believe we need to learn how to listen. Listen. Because the more we give of our time, our attention, and our investment, the more we use these most costly things in our lives and put them into learning how to listen, the more we can be led by the Spirit. And I'll tell you this, where the Spirit leads, there's going to be fruit. Let me pray. Father God, we thank you now, uh, Lord, and we pray that you would continue to speak to us, send your Spirit, and put a, uh, help us get into a posture where we can listen and be led by you. And so, Lord, I pray that for everyone here this morning as we head out into our week, wherever we do life, that we can continue to be led by the Spirit. Lord, we love you. In your name we pray. Amen.